On the night of June 3, 1989, tanks and armored vehicles of the People's Liberation Army moved into Beijing and put an end to seven weeks of peaceful protest. After the shooting on the night of June 3rd, when I found out that so many people had died, I felt neither anger nor sorrow, nothing. I was completely numb. There was a huge emptiness. I just couldn't believe they would open fire. In the first few days after my son was killed, many friends, colleagues, and students came to express their sympathy. They all said that soon the official verdict would be overturned. But as investigations and arrests began, fewer and fewer people came to see me. When people ran into me, they were silent. It was as though nothing had ever happened. Events do not deliver their meanings to us. They are always interpreted. On the morning of June 5th, there was a moment that would come to symbolize the hope and the tragedy of those spring days. He disappeared into the crowd afterwards, and no one knows where he is now. No one is even certain of his name. But for the millions who saw this scene all over the world, its meaning was clear. Here was human hope and courage, challenging the remorseless machinery of state power. The Chinese government interpreted this scene just as simply, but differently. In the days after the end of the protest at Tiananmen, large numbers of people were arrested all over China. I heard the government's most wanted list on the radio. At first, it seemed only students were on the list, but I finally heard my own name. I couldn't stand the humiliation of being hunted down by the police. I wanted to maintain as much dignity as possible while facing the inevitable. So I decided to go to the police on my own. I told the police, I've come here because you've got your facts wrong. I don't know if it's deliberate or because you don't understand what really happened. Since I was involved, I feel it's my duty to straighten you out. When individuals stand up to power, they bring to the encounter the lessons that power has taught them and the harm it has done them. Merely to stand up does not free us from these things. Behind every gesture of hope and courage lies a life a society, a history. Tiananmen, the gate of heavenly peace, is the gate leading into the imperial city, for centuries the center of power in China. In 1919, though the emperor had long been overthrown, students gathered at Tiananmen to denounce the government's failure to stand up to foreign powers. Their protest spread quickly through the country and came to be known as the May 4th Movement. Years of student demonstrations followed. Despite violent government repression, arrests, and killings, generation after generation, the students came out to protest, inspiring other Chinese to follow them. China was in danger, and corrupt officials didn't care. Young intellectuals felt they must place their lives on the line to awaken the people. They aim to save the nation through democracy and modern science and the discarding of oppressive traditions. When the great change did come, it came from the countryside, a peasant army led in part by people who had participated in the student protests. Mao Zedong's communist army entered Beijing in 1949. National power returned to the city 
and to Tiananmen. The traditional rulers of China had always remained hidden behind the closed gates of the imperial city. When Mao appeared before the people atop Tiananmen, he reversed centuries of symbolism. The center of power was visibly shifted from the imperial city behind the gate to the broad masses in front, all facing the leader who stood above. Before the founding ceremonies of the People's Republic of China in 1949, Tiananmen Square was full of weeds as high as your waist. Students from Beijing and Tsinghua universities volunteered to clear away all the weeds. Yes, it was students then too. At that time, young people were very enthusiastic about the People's Liberation Army and about the revolution. It was at Tiananmen that the People's Republic of China was founded. It was at Tiananmen that Mao announced, the Chinese people have stood up. When I was a child, I went to Tiananmen twice a year for the parades. Mao stood on Tiananmen Gate. After the parade had passed, a huge crowd of children would rush up to the gate, shouting joyfully. No words, just the sound of children's voices. This created the desired effect. I was one of those children. I would wave flowers or release balloons or doves. Mao would wave his hand like this. At that time, many communist leaders moved into quarters within the old imperial city. Before, they had lived with the peasants, and it was said, fish cannot live out of water. But after the revolution, if a peasant went into the city to look up a leader he had known in the past, he wouldn't be able to find him. The water could no longer find the fish. The fish were inside the palace. And Mao himself became, in effect, the emperor, hailed as a man who would live forever. Of course, I was unable to see it like this in the 1950s. In the 1950s, the government ordered the building of a great square in front of Tiananmen to accommodate the masses. Several of China's later leaders first came to prominence as dedicated model workers in the building of the square. The gigantic square would become the largest public space in the world and the center of Chinese political life. On one side of it was built a great hall of the people. On the other, a museum of history and the revolution. In the center of the square stood the monument commemorating the martyrs of the revolution, a tombstone of the great dead, which consecrates the square as sacred ground. The monument depicts scenes from China's history since 1840. There are no recognizable individuals. Collectively, they represent the people. Among the ancestors of New China pictured on the monument are the students of May 4, 1919, protesting before the gate itself. When the students of 1989 occupied Tiananmen Square, they made their headquarters here, beneath images of other students who changed China's history. They were consciously associating themselves with the tradition of student protest in China. By their own actions, they were adding further meaning to this place, the place in all of China most charged with meaning. Good morning, beloved Peking. Good morning, beloved Tiananmen, gate of heavenly peace. In Mao's era, Tiananmen became the symbol of the new China, the gate and the square, the people, and the leader who expressed the people's will. Tiananmen had once led into the imperial palace. Now, it was the focus 
of Mao Square. Mao and Tiananmen were one. Tiananmen Square became completely entangled with the lives of the Chinese people. This was because under the Communist Party, everyone's life became involved with politics. When I graduated from university in 1966, I sincerely believed what I was taught, that I was a brand new boat to be used in the construction of the great mansion of communism. I was willing to be put wherever my country needed me, and I was prepared to stay in place my whole life. To me, Mao was like God. I believed that he was not only the great leader of the Chinese people, but also the great leader of people throughout the world. I feared the day when he would no longer be with us. I really hoped there'd be a scientific breakthrough that would enable young people like us to voluntarily give up a year of our lives to add a minute to his. That way the world would be saved. <laughs> In 1976, Mao died between an earthquake and a solar eclipse, traditional portents of the end of an era. At the funeral, the great throng faced Tiananmen, but the place where Mao had stood was empty. All of the leaders remained on a platform below. Mao still resides in the square. The mausoleum built in 1977 at the south end of the square is not a tomb so much as a grand villa. It contains a huge marble armchair for the chairman and a bed too where he lies. I didn't shed a single tear when Mao died. I felt I'd been cheated. I've never visited the Mao mausoleum. It's so disgusting. Mao is dead but not gone. The great portrait that hangs on Tiananmen still presides over every parade and celebration held in the Great Square. During the student demonstrations of 1989, three men from Mao's own home province of Hunan splattered the great portrait with ink. The students immediately distanced themselves from this act. They denounced the outrage and helped arrest the men responsible. Shortly after the desecration, gale force winds blew and torrents of rain fell on the square. Some people actually wondered, was the chairman displeased? Within hours, the portrait was replaced. But it is not only Mao's face, his vision of history, his language, his actions still loom large in China's imagination. Communism is actually a promise of something perfect. It's easy for people who are dissatisfied with all the imperfections of real life to be attracted to it. During the 1930s and 40s, many people were drawn to the Communist Party because they wanted to escape the ugly reality and they longed for the promise. Throughout the first decade of the revolution, that promise had the support of large segments of society. Mao provided the vision of an ideal society, but he had little interest in the day-to-day -day work of bringing it about. That was left to his associates. Among them was Deng Xiaoping. Mao had the personality of a romantic poet. Deng's is that of a pragmatist. He's not a puritanical theoretician or an idealist. He's different from Mao in that he knows that when people are hungry, they need to eat. They can't live on poetry. During the 1950s, Mao launched wave after wave of persecutions against people who held different views. By 1959, no one dared express any dissenting opinions anymore. He had to have the last word on everything. And people would have tolerated it if his policies had worked out well. But he made a mess of things. Millions of people starved to death. 
So his comrades had to help patch things up. This meant a slight retreat from Mao's utopian illusions. Deng liked to quote a Sichuan proverb, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white. If it catches mice, it's a good cat. But Mao's solution, when things went wrong, was always more revolution, not less. He saw anyone who stood between him and his masses as an enemy. He saw bureaucrats and lingering bourgeois elements undermining the original promise of the revolution. Against the government bureaucracy, Mao mobilized his masses. A fresh uprising of the people, the only source of progress. Mao called it a cultural revolution. The people were enjoying Da Min Ju, mass democracy. Chaos can't harm us, he proclaimed. It can only harm our enemies. Mao lost control of the cultural revolution. It became a war of all against all. Deng Xiaoping was among those attacked. Mao stripped him of his power, then brought him back to repair a shattered society. Like those in power who had experienced Mao's mass democracy, Deng Xiaoping's greatest fear would be Dong Luan, turmoil, chaos, upheaval. When the students of 1989 took to the streets, they too were branded as stirring up Dong Luan. Many leaders in the government saw them in the light of the past. They were a throwback to the horrors of the Cultural Revolution that had nearly destroyed China. At the end of the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese economy was on the verge of bankruptcy. What could be done? Now here's where Deng Xiaoping was really smart. His prescription was capitalism. Reform and opening up actually meant learning from capitalism. But he couldn't say that outright, because capitalism was supposed to be our arch enemy. Now how could you turn around and learn from our enemy? So Deng came up with something called socialism with Chinese characteristics. He followed his instincts. First and foremost, the people didn't have enough to eat. They had to be fed. Secondly, the people who had been politically wronged had to be exonerated. These were very practical things. Little did he know what tremendous changes would be triggered once this process began. It was deep winter, 1979, when a thaw began to be felt. A stretch of bare wall near the city center became a place where people posted their hopes and fears about the new China. There were a dozen unofficial journals, too, and new voices heard. A young man named Wei Jingsheng wrote a poster. What China needed was more than the four modernizations the government was promoting in agriculture, industry, science, and defense. China needed a fifth modernization, democracy. Democracy wasn't the result of progress, Wei Jingsheng argued. It was a precondition for progress. <laughs> Meanwhile, Deng Xiaoping was on the road. Apparently moving away from communist ideology, Deng was welcomed in America. Time magazine named him Man of the Year. In the U.S., China's economic reforms were greeted with enthusiasm. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and His Excellency Deng Xiaoping, the Vice Premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China. Mr. Vice Premier, it is with great joy that we welcome you to our country. 
And it is with true love that we extend our very best wishes to you and your people on your new long march toward modernization in this century. I thank you very much, Kweto Chen. Thank you. Deng Xiaoping went to America, and soon after, hope came to China. Hey, we're off on the road to China with fun and adventure in mind. The seventh wonder of the world is here beneath our feet. Compared to this, the road to Mandalay is obsolete. Hey, this is it, Peking, China. Amazing, isn't it? Just 10 years ago, who would have dreamt an American comedian would be standing here in Tiananmen Square saying whatever he pleased and photographing anything he pleased. But in this fast-moving world, radical changes can occur overnight. Take a look at this square. Almost 100 acres. Looks like Jackie Gleason's patio. <laughs> now they can get a million and a half people in here. Of course, they're not here today. Nobody knew I was coming. Americans felt an enormous relief. The Chinese are, after all, just like us. They want what we want, and maybe we can sell it to them. But even as China and the U.S. swapped celebrities and made deals, the dark gates closed on others. For his warning that Deng might become a new dictator, Wei Jingsheng was framed and sentenced to 15 years. He was still in prison when the students came to Tiananmen in 1989 to demand democracy. Few of them knew his story. In China, if you wanted to express your opinions, you had to speak from within the Communist Party. If you talked outside, they'd throw you in jail. The only option for a pure idealist is to commit suicide. I once wrote an essay entitled, Commit Suicide and Save the Country. Of course, it didn't pass the censors. I'd completely lost faith in the Communist Party. I thought the only workable thing was to join up and try and change it. Committing suicide myself wouldn't do the country much good. A more useful thing to do was to help the Communist Party commit suicide. Lenin had taught us that the easiest way to take a fortress is from within. There's also the Trojan horse in ancient Greece. If you can't win through confrontation, you have to try sneaking inside. That someone like myself could join the party was because cracks had already appeared. Before Deng's reforms, someone like me would never have been let in. Now begins the Grand Mass Parade to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. By 1984, when the People's Republic marked its 35th anniversary, there was something new to celebrate, the success of Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Once, Deng had been purged by Mao for his disobedience. Now, Deng was no longer under the great teacher's shadow. He could make his own plans, and he had the power to execute them. He would be called the grand architect of reform. By Deng's side, were his loyal ministers, Hu Yabong, Zhao Ziyang, men given the task of reform, men who can also be blamed when reform went too far. Some students in the parade raised a homemade banner greeting Deng by his first name. Hello, Xiaoping, an unheard of liberty. People were genuinely grateful to Deng. China's industry is advancing toward modernization. Like agriculture, it will soon be carried forward on the wave of reform. The early reforms brought quick and dramatic change. In the countryside, communes were broken up. Rural markets were revived. Farmers started to make money. There was a lot more money to be made. The old men in charge were changing China.
the results were going to be seen everywhere. After decades of relative isolation, China was looking outward to the world. Just ahead, all the enticements of capitalism beckoned. Our life is getting better and better. The light industry float shows how life is becoming more colorful as our living standards rise. The National Day celebrations in 1984 were an elaborate, enthusiastic affair. Many people saw a bright future ahead. But why did my friends and I feel so depressed? The overcast sky, the lone figure of Dong Xiaoping popping out of that car, riding stern face down Chang'an Avenue. I thought it all boded ill for the future. That kind of spectacle was the heritage of the Mao era. It was an embodiment of revolution. And for us, revolution was made up of a small number of ambitious political careerists on the one hand and the frenzied masses on the other. And we were fed up with all that. A measure of economic prosperity had been achieved by 1984, but we saw countless difficulties ahead, and we didn't know how heavy a price the Chinese people might still have to pay. All I could do was to help change things bit by bit. I knew I couldn't make that much difference, but that didn't matter, because there was nothing else worth doing anyway. Singing and dancing, a million and a half people in the capital attend the Grand National Day Evening Carnival. The carnival evening will forever remain in our memories. Come to see Tiananmen, come to see our country in five years' time. On May 28, 1989, a student leader named Chai Ling requested an interview with an American journalist. Tiananmen Square was then occupied by students. Martial law had been declared. No one knew what might happen. The interview was recorded with a home video camera. These may be my last words, because the situation is becoming very grim. My name is Chai Ling. I am 23 years old. Oddly enough, my birthday is on April 15th, the day Hu Yaobang died. Hu Yaobang had been the general secretary of the party and Deng Xiaoping's chosen successor. Public mourning for Hu would last for a week and would become the ground from which all the demonstrations of 1989 would grow. In many ways, the movement is not very mature. An opportunity presented itself accidentally. No one knew Hu Yaobang was going to die when he did. This movement is a great manifestation of the natural democratic instincts of the students and the people, a spontaneous expression of the people's own interests. I've come into contact with people from all walks of life. They feel they have no security. Many have gone overseas. I feel this country is finished. It's going to die. Hu Yabang had been removed from power two years before his death. He'd been accused of leaning towards bourgeois liberalism. 
No one protested openly when Hu was purged, but now people claimed him as a champion of enlightened rule. Mourning for him became a cover for protest against those still in power, or as it was said at the time, the men who should drop dead are still alive, yet the man who should be alive is dead. In Chinese culture, there's a phenomenon I'd call the cult of the dead. After death, all the man's flaws are forgotten and his memory is enshrined in a halo of glory. Then people use the dead man to vent their anger and express their hopes. It was clear to me that people weren't simply concerned with one man's death. Hu Yobang's death made it possible for a crowd to gather in a public place. It gave them something to discuss. And that led to discussions of all kinds of other issues. Most of the talk was about our own lives. My parents kept saying, in the past, although wages were low, it was easy to raise you three children. How come these days, even with you holding a job, we're always short of money? Deng Xiaoping's reforms, which had been so popular, were disappointing a lot of people by the end of the 80s. Workers could no longer count on lifelong employment, the iron rice bowl, and the socialist safety net of medical benefits and pensions was being dismantled. Factories had trouble paying their workers. So they kicked out a bunch of people. But they didn't use the word fire. They called it reprioritizing the workforce. All these things came with reform. Everyone knows what happened in the early stages of capitalism. The competition was savage and there was no protection for the weak. In the quest for profits, there was a total disregard for the impact on the society and the environment. This is exactly what's happening in China right now. We're in a transitionary period. The reforms are necessary, but workers have to protect their own interests. To get rich was glorious, said the government. But those who got rich were mostly people in power and insiders who had always done well. Only government and industry cadre could work the turnover, buying goods at fixed government prices and selling them on the free market at a big profit. More than anything else, workers complained of corruption. The officials take and take, damn it, so why can't we take? How come when we take, we're called criminals, and when you take, you're not? People needed to vent their anger, but they were worried because so many had been persecuted in the past just for speaking out. In a crowd, they felt it was safe to let off steam. Often someone would rant and rave and then quickly disappear back into the crowd. But I felt that the reason for a lot of my suffering was that hardly anyone took responsibility for what they said or did. I thought I should try and set an example. So I told people my name whenever I spoke, to show that I was prepared to take the consequences for what I said. I wanted to indicate to people that to change a society, you had to start with yourself. Students and intellectuals had been among the strongest supporters of the reforms. Yet, after a decade of economic growth, they enjoyed few of the benefits. There's a saying in Beijing, you're as poor as a professor and as dumb as a PhD. This was really true. No matter how hard you worked, you couldn't get anywhere. There is something really wrong with the reforms. Those in power have benefited from them, not the people. Although there is superficial economic prosperity, the masses and the intellectuals have been deprived of any hope or initiative.
The Communist Party had always defined Minju democracy in just this way, the people in charge. But if real democracy was to be implemented, how were the people to take charge? China is so huge and communications are so bad. Even if you were to call national elections tomorrow, how would people know whom to vote for? Conditions weren't right for a sudden leap to that stage of democracy. But people did know whom they wanted to elect in their local communities. So open elections were already possible at the village level. When this form of democracy became more routine, we could introduce broader elections on the county level, and then higher and higher up. Those of us who were working for Zhao Ziyong pushed for this type of grassroots level democratic election. Of course, the hardline communists immediately saw this as a threat to their power. So they were dead set against it. As for the intellectuals, they said, grassroots democracy is not important. What we want to determine is the fate of China, not just the fate of a village, a county. So we had trouble getting support. Students dissatisfied with the status quo might have taken up the hard work of building democracy at the local level. Or they might have organized to demand redress of their own grievances as underpaid and undervalued intellectual workers. But that's not what interested most students. They talked, as Chinese students have always talked, of saving China. Hu Yaobang's death was caused by the mental stress resulting from his illegal removal from office. We thought commemorating one man was not going to help China. To ensure our nation's positive development, we had to start transforming the political system. We wanted to use this opportunity to put forth our political demands. Around midnight on April 17th, we set out from Beijing University. We carried a banner that read, The Soul of China. On the morning of the 18th, over a thousand students held a meeting in the square. The students settled on seven demands and wrote up a petition. They carried the petition to various government offices. At Xinhua Man, the entrance to the old palace compound, where China's top leaders live and work, the students waited for an answer. The students surged towards the gate a number of times, so I went over to the big red columns. I called out to them. I'm a worker. I've been a soldier myself, and I think what you're doing is very risky. This is the seat of the highest power in the nation. If you storm in, the government will have every reason to mow you down. I said, to sacrifice yourselves like this is completely meaningless. We should use other methods to achieve our goals. I told people to stop pushing, to sit down and wait. Eventually the crowd settled down. There were no clashes that night. The next night I didn't go to Xinhua Men. But later I heard there'd been a bloody incident. Woshitinia 打傷人數可以說不計其數而且他們對我們的女同學進行了猥褻侮辱反對這樣反對暴力反對暴力
们是有组织的，我们不是乌合之众，我们是这个社会的文明的分子。我相信我们大家都有都会这样认为，所以我们要有秩序的、有纪律的组织这件事这次活动。呃，北京市的各个高校呢，现在正在努力，呃，努力争取联合起来。我们是决定罢课，不达目的誓不复课。To achieve concrete results, student activists felt they needed a new organization of their own. Those who were willing to lead it were taking a great risk. On the night of April 19th, a new student union was formed at Beijing University. Seven people volunteered to be on the organizing committee. They became the leaders because they were courageous enough to step forward. There were no formal elections. Later, the committee made many efforts to organize elections, but because we constantly faced new crises, we couldn't do what we'd originally intended. Organizing committees appeared on many Beijing campuses and within days formed a citywide coalition of independent student unions. Before dawn on April 22nd, Students gathered at Tiananmen for Hu Yabong's official funeral. The list of their grievances had lengthened. With every passing day, Hu and mourning in his name was acquiring greater significance. On April 22nd, a memorial ceremony for Hu Yaobang was held in the Great Hall of the People. When I entered, I felt that the atmosphere was very grim. The ceremony seemed hurried. And after Party Secretary General Zhao Ziyang read the eulogy, all the leaders from the Central Committee rushed off. When I came out of the Great Hall of the People, I saw a huge crowd gathered in Tiananmen Square. I wanted to go over to them, but there were nine rows of police standing between us. The students had brought their petition and demanded that Li Peng, the Prime Minister, come out to accept it himself. When we saw our classmates kneeling there, holding the petition with raised arms, everyone cried. In it were our suggestions to the government, but we had to hand it in kneeling down. No one paid any attention. No one came forward to accept it. We all saw those three students. We workers felt, Premier, you should come out. You should accept the petition and answer their demands. Even if you don't agree, you should at least make some gesture. But the Premier just left. He completely ignored the students. Now, how do you expect people to take that? How could the government be so callous? Many of us who had just gathered inside the Great Hall had taken part in student movements when we were young. So why were we treating the students this way now? During those early days of the student movement, 
We pleaded with the authorities, petitioned them like loyal subjects in traditional China. At first, we made direct appeals. Then we pleaded with tears and on bended knees. Yes, we were even willing to kneel down before them, like subjects petitioning the emperor. We had to beg them to come out and talk to us. But then again, it's fair to say that the government virtually crumbled under the weight of our knees. What the students were opposing now were the very same things we had opposed in our youth. Why had we turned into a party which was against the people and the students? This was not the same Communist Party I had once joined. Good evening. Thousands of Chinese students took to the streets today in defiance of a government ban on public protests. The students' chant was for democracy, their demands for political reform. The backdrop was a memorial service for fallen leader Hu Yaobang. I was in New York at the time. This sort of news was on television and in the papers every day. When friends got together, all we talked about were these events. The TV images affected me deeply. I thought, what's the use of getting all worked up about it if you're so far away? I had to go back. So I got on a plane leaving New York on April 26th. When I was changing planes in Tokyo, I met someone who had just come from China. He said, what do you think you can do back there? Haven't you heard about the editorial that just appeared? It calls the movement a plot by a small handful to instigate anti-party, anti-state Dong Luan. Dong Luan. Turmoil, upheaval, chaos. A People's Daily editorial denounced the demonstrations. We must unequivocally oppose Dong Luan, the headline read. Such an editorial, appearing in the official Communist Party media, amounted to a charge of criminal conspiracy. It was dangerous for me to go back. I even asked about flights returning to New York. But then I heard the boarding announcement for my flight to Beijing. I didn't have time to hesitate. I had to get on that plane. I thought, what the heck? Live or die, I'll just go. With the April 26th editorial, the government took a firm stand against the student movement. The Communist Party has a tradition of passing judgment on social incidents through the media. In the past, Mao had written quite a few People's Daily editorials himself. He launched a number of mass political persecutions this way. That's why when the April 26 editorial came out, people assumed that it represented Deng's attitude toward the student demonstrations. Everyone expected that the government would crack down on any new demonstrations. We were very angry. What petty minds. These people in the government have gone completely haywire. Just listen to what they're saying. It sounds like the Cultural Revolution all over again. The mindset, even the words, were identical to the editorial which came out after the Tiananmen incident of 1976. We all lived through that episode. And we know how that ended up. The editorial of April 26th reminded many people of what happened after another great state funeral, the events of 1976, known to everyone as the Tiananmen Incident. In January of 1976, Premier Zhou Enlai, Mao's close associate, one of the great heroes of the revolution, died. The people of the capital could not restrain their bitter grief. They left their homes and gathered on the sidewalks of the Chang'an Boulevard, along which the cortege would pass. Zhou was widely regarded as a moderate, 
more humane and tolerant than other top leaders. Just as the mourning for Huyabong in 1989 was the occasion for protest, the outpouring of grief for Zhou Enlai was a reproach to the hardliners in power. Can't you stop for a moment, dear Premier? This is Tian An Men. Don't you remember the many festive occasions we celebrated here together? Your ringing laughter is still in our ears. Your warm gaze rests on our tears. Beloved Premier Zhou, how we miss you, how we need you. The times when important leaders die are dangerous. Zhou Enlai was a mentor of Deng Xiaoping. He helped bring Deng back into government to counter the excesses of the Cultural Revolution. Deng gave the eulogy at Zhou's funeral. But the events following Zhou's death would once again bring Deng Xiaoping down. That April, during the traditional festival in honor of the dead, Thousands of people gathered spontaneously in Tiananmen Square to lay wreaths in honor of Zhou Enlai. They read poems, gave speeches. Reports made to Mao said the agitation was really directed against him. Police removed the wreaths, but people brought more. Police ordered the crowds to disperse. The crowds overturned a police van and set it afire. At last, Mao took action. Workers armed with clubs were sent in, there were beatings and arrests. In the official press, the events in the square were denounced as counter-revolutionary violence inspired by a small handful of conspirators. The alleged mastermind behind the turmoil was that unrepentant reactionary, Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> Deng was denounced, condemned, forced from power. Not until after Mao's death would he emerge as China's new paramount leader. Then, the verdict on the 1976 upheavals would be reversed. The scenes in Tiananmen Square would be replayed with a different meaning. They became courageous demonstrations of the people's will. And yet now, in 1989, the government of Deng Xiaoping faced again with protests inspired by the death of a leader, reached for the old words of denunciation. Once again, the Supreme Leader heard reports that the agitation was directed against him. Once again, a small handful of conspirators were supposedly plotting to bring down the state. Once again, the irrevocable judgment was passed. The editorial of April 26th caught the students by total surprise. We didn't expect that the government would jump to such a vicious conclusion about us. We felt that without large-scale street action, we couldn't compete with the propaganda machine of the government, and the people wouldn't know the truth about what we were doing. The Chinese constitution guarantees the people free speech and the right to demonstrate. But Chinese law punishes counter-revolutionary instigation by the enemies of the people. The final arbiter was the Communist Party. Were the students the people? Or were they now enemies of the people who must be suppressed? I got together with some friends to talk about the situation. All of us were teachers at various universities. We heard that huge numbers of police would be deployed the next day. This really worried us. We decided to demonstrate with our students. We felt that we must show where we stood at a moment like this. In the early morning of April 27th, students set out from campuses all over the city and walked toward Tiananmen Square, the political center of China. Police were placed on alert throughout Beijing and positioned to blockade key intersections along the route. Beijing, 
We were prepared to face great danger. Some students even wrote their wills. This was because we had heard that the government was moving in troops to suppress any further demonstrations. Everyone showed a lot of self-control. Since the government had accused us of instigating turmoil, we were eager to show the people that we weren't a lawless mob, nor were we trying to overthrow the Communist Party or socialism. Many workers were furious. The government said that the students were instigating turmoil. Well, the way I see it, if the students were wrong, you wouldn't have to send the police or the soldiers. There are plenty of young workers like me who could beat them up. But the students were right. They expressed what was in the hearts of us workers. That's why we went out to support them. I was really moved that day. The students held out cardboard boxes for donations, and I stuffed money in them. When I saw the students were sweating, I bought popsicles for them. I supported this demonstration because it was focused against one of the most fundamental means by which the Communist Party maintains its rule, that is, to accuse people of fabricated political crimes. The students showed real conviction. They put their lives and their future on the line to fight this unjust system. When we started out, I was very worried about the possibility of bloodshed. I kept telling the students that if we encountered the police, we should not force our way past them. At one point, the clash with the police was so intense that people could have been trampled to death. I was almost crushed in the crowd. But it was obvious that the police were not ordered to beat people up. They only try to form a human blockade. The students met little further resistance. They continued their march toward Tiananmen Square. The students were very pleased with themselves for breaking through police lines, and the cheering of onlookers made them feel like real heroes. The whole thing now turned into a carnival, because there was no more danger, and everyone was watching the students' big show. That was how I felt later that day, completely different from when I started out. It had been an unprecedented day. A mass student demonstration, held in the face of government warnings, had been allowed to march peacefully through the streets. And that very day, the government announced that it was willing to talk. In this event, both sides had made efforts to exercise restraint. This unprecedented moment could have opened up new possibilities, if only people understood what it meant. But a historical opportunity is often easily overlooked, easily passed by. Unfortunately, this was just what happened. I had just arrived back in China at that point. I suggested to the students that it was not a good idea to continue staging huge demonstrations. Once you have shown your strength, you should return to classes and try to secure some specific democratic rights on campus. Few students were ready simply to go back to class. But what should they do next? The triumph of April 27th would be the last moment in which all parties working for change were united. The euphoria soon began to fade, and disagreements over tactics developed. What a student movement represents is a call for social justice. There are times when we have no choice but to take to the streets to express our ideas, vent our anger, and show our determination to change things. April 27th was such a time. The students did a great job, and the government was forced to change its usual behavior. But our ultimate goal is to change the entire system. This cannot be accomplished by students staying in the streets. The students demanded that the government grant legal status to their new organization, the Coalition of Independent Student Unions, and talk with them as equals. 
They wanted Dui Hua, dialogue. One of the most important demands raised by the students was for the government to have a dialogue with them. Where did the idea of dialogue come from? Actually, Zhao Ziyang was the first to promote it. He said government leaders should engage in dialogue with ordinary people. The party hardliners opposed this from the start. It's absurd, they said. The party and the people are one family. How can a family negotiate with itself? You're trying to imitate the West. They wouldn't even let us use the word Dui Hua. Dui Hua, dialogue, was a key part of the reformers' strategy to open up the political system. It was aimed at making officials at all levels more responsive to popular opinion. The head of the party, General Secretary Zhao Ziyang, was a leading advocate of these reforms. At the 1987 Party Congress, Zhao was finally able to get the principle of dialogue adopted as official policy. But to have the entrenched party bureaucracy behave in new ways was another matter. On April 29th, the government held a meeting with representatives of the official student union of Beijing. Only a few of the new activists managed to get in. Yuan Mu was the government spokesman. His was not the new, more open-faced that Zhao Ziyang wanted. He spoke with the voice of standard party authoritarianism, and he did most of the talking. The independent student unions called this meeting a fraud. Surrounded by the media, the student leaders made the rounds of government offices to present their conditions for further talks. At one government bureau, a group from the countryside was trying to get their grievances heard. Grassroots democracy hadn't reached their village, so they were doing what they'd always done kneeling before the offices of the central government to beg for official intervention in their local problems. They were having little luck getting anyone to listen. The students said that unless the government accepted their preconditions for dialogue, they would march again. <laughs> We some student activists were trying to institute elections, and they were getting support on campus. Through elections on many campuses, a student dialogue group was formed. The students now changed their tactics. Rather than demanding official recognition as a precondition for dialogue, they were willing to talk right away. And they wanted to talk about their constitutional rights. The aim of dialogue was not to solve everything at once. We wanted to establish some ground rules open up some channels for communication so that whenever problems arose, there'd be ways of resolving them. We wanted to lay some foundations for the future. We wanted to make a good start. What we were hoping for was gradual progress, reform, not cataclysmic change, not revolution. Because honestly, in 1989, the situation wasn't so bad that people felt they needed a revolution. A new path seemed to be opening up, a path leading away from the confrontational politics that had dominated China for decades, the path China had long ago failed to take. On May 4th, China celebrated the 70th anniversary of the demonstrations of 1919, 
when patriotic students had first protested against an unresponsive government. There were two celebrations on that day. The government sponsored commemorations at the monument and a mass student march from the university district to Tiananmen Square. students sang a patriotic song from the 1930s. In official Communist Party history, the student protests of 1919 were but a prelude to the party's revolutionary makeover of China. But in fact, many of the leading voices of the May 4th era spoke not for revolution, but for democratic reform. After their days of street protest, many students went back to school, took up various professions, and continued to work for social change. Those who saw no hope for reform joined the Communist Party to fight for an ideal society. Over the decades, the voices championing gradual change were either stifled by conservative power holders or drowned out by cries for revolution. By marching into Tiananmen Square, the students of 1989 were saying to the party, we are the true inheritors of the democratic legacy of the May 4th movement. But the May 4th spirit they were most familiar with was the one the party had taught them. In the value system of the Communist Party, revolution is placed at the top. So comrades are called revolutionary comrades, couples revolutionary couples, and families revolutionary families. Everything is revolutionary. Reform is not a good word in communist vocabulary. What we were trying to do was to introduce the idea of incremental change to the people of China. We were trying to tell them that reform was not a bad thing and that revolution often failed to deliver its promise. Once again, the government had not suppressed the march. In fact, the leaders at the top were deeply divided on how to deal with the protesters. On the very day of the May 4th anniversary, Party Secretary General Zhao Ziyang made a speech that departed surprisingly from the hardline April 26th editorial. In a nationally televised meeting with foreign bankers, Zhao told his audience that there was no serious turmoil in China. Due Hua, dialogue, Zhao said, was the solution to the present tension. The students now debated. Should they go back to class and show support for this conciliatory attitude? Or did Zhao Ziyang's remarks indicate deep rifts in the central government that must be exploited by pushing harder, going farther? Many students went back to class. On May 8th, several leaders of the Independent Student Union of my university came to see me. They complained about the students who had returned to class and said they wanted to blockade the classrooms. I said, I thought you were demanding democracy. A basic principle of democracy is the right of individual choice. If you deprive others of their choice, how is that different from the way the Communist Party has always deprived you of your choice? It had not even occurred to them that this was a problem. They couldn't come up with any good arguments in response, but they still felt uncomfortable. They said, then how can we get anything done? In China, everything has always been handled this way. Only by preventing others from doing what they want can you accomplish what you want. The movement at Beijing University also reached the low point. More and more students returned to class. A lot of energy was wasted debating whether we should go back to class or not. I felt increasingly frustrated. At that time, I thought we should resume classes because I felt a stalemate like this wouldn't necessarily get us anywhere. And the students were pretty tired. On May 10th, 
Wang Dan gave an interview to a Canadian television reporter. I think that the student movement should move on to a new stage. No more large-scale, intense street action. No more boycotting classes. Instead, we need down-to-earth work to build democracy on campus. The legalization of student organizations, independent student newspapers and radio stations, and so on. This work might not look all that grand or glamorous, but it's extremely important. And yet, over the heads of the prominent student leaders still hung the People's Daily editorial of April 26th, the shadow of Dong Luan. That threat cut off any impulse toward moderation. Once we were chatting, I said, how many years do political offenders get? Someone said it used to be three years, then it was increased to five years, then seven, and then 17 years. I felt very sad. If I got 17 years, I'd be 40 by the time I got out. I really didn't want that to happen. On May 11th, six of us discussed the situation. We had placed a lot of hope on talks with the government, but they kept putting it off. We feared that the movement would run out of momentum. Then the government would have been able to arrest the student leaders one by one and disband the independent unions. So it was necessary to escalate the movement, to use more radical methods and apply more pressure to force the government to concede to our demands. Since demonstrations and sit-down strikes no longer bothered the government, we felt the next step should be a hunger strike. Wang Dan told me about the hunger strike, and I immediately signed on. Then we tried to persuade the leaders of the independent student unions, but some of them were firmly opposed to a hunger strike. I think they have a tendency towards opportunism. As is so often the case, democratic procedures were getting in the way of political action. Unable to achieve a consensus within the independent student unions, the people in favor of a hunger strike bypassed the new organization and made personal appeals to the students. On the evening of May 12th, Chai Ling and I addressed the students. She did most of the talking. She said that the government was forcing us to put our lives on the line. She was crying emotionally. This got everyone really stirred up. I said, we are staging a hunger strike in order to reveal the true face of the government and the true face of the people. We want to see whether the Chinese have any conscience whether there is any hope for China. I said, we are prepared to face death for the sake of true life. The oath written by our lives will brighten the skies of our country. At noon on May 13th, the hunger strikers shared a last ceremonial meal. The strikers wanted the government to repeal the April 26th editorial and hold televised talks with the students. That morning, the government had met one of these demands. They'd agreed to talks with the dialogue group. But by the time this news reached the universities, the hunger strikers had already set out for Tiananmen Square. Their declaration, born of a tradition of romantic communist rhetoric, was both heroic and deeply emotional. It even included some lines from Mao's youth. This country is our country. This people, our people. If we don't speak out, who will? If we don't take action, who will? At the height of youthful happiness and beauty, the hunger strikers proclaimed, we must resolutely leave everything behind us. Mother China, witness now the actions of your sons and daughters. Can you remain indifferent as hunger devours our youth and death approaches?
很不容易，尤其是昨天晚上三点到凌晨之间这一段，同学们又冷又饿，那同学们挺过来了，很有可能我们还要挺过像昨天这样的第三个、第五个夜晚，希望大家能够尽可能的坚持到底。有没有决心？有。谢谢大家，真是好战友。The hunger strike could not have come at a worse time for the government. That week, a historic meeting, years in preparation, was to take place. The president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, was coming to China. A grand welcoming ceremony was scheduled to take place in Tiananmen Square, which was filled at the moment with thousands of students. On May 15th, the government planned to welcome Gorbachev at Tiananmen Square. Everyone knew that the square would have to be cleared. So the students thought that if they staged the hunger strike there, the government would definitely respond by May 15th. I heard many students talk like this. On the afternoon of May 14th, less than 24 hours before Gorbachev's arrival, the government began talks with the dialogue group. The main official representative was Yan Ming Fu, a leading reformist minister. Some students who had initiated the hunger strike were also present. Wu Kai Shi was one of them. The biggest victory of the whole movement was that our hunger strike forced the government to the negotiating table. We demanded a live television broadcast, but the government agreed only to a pre-recorded broadcast. So we made a concession on this point. We felt that a pre-recorded broadcast was in itself a hard-won achievement. But the hunger strikers who were waiting at the square did not hear the promised broadcast. Feeling betrayed, many of them rushed to the meeting hall and disrupted the session. So the talks were wrecked by the students themselves. I felt that May 14th was a big setback for the student movement. After this, the students missed many more opportunities by repeating the same mistakes. It was the eve of Gorbachev's arrival, and talks between the students and the government had broken down. When we speak of the government, we're talking about two kinds of people the reformers who were in power at the time, and the hardliners who opposed them. Reform was in a very precarious situation and came under constant attack. The reformers hoped for social stability so that they could continue their difficult work. The hardliners had been using all kinds of underhanded tactics to get Deng Xiaoping to turn against the reformers. But they hadn't seen much success. So they wanted to create a massive crisis in order to get rid of the reformers, as they had Hu Yaobang. I was worried that reform would be derailed. If that happened, then all the grand sloganizing about democracy, about abolishing dictatorship, and so on, would simply be a lot of hot air. The 12 scholars, journalists, and critics were well-known supporters of liberal reform in China and widely respected. They all praised the students, but called on them to change their tactics.
The problem with these intellectuals was that they were playing the wrong role. They were acting as mediators between the students and the government. We made the government agree to face-to-face -face negotiations. This was the first time in 40 years, and we accomplished it. We, the students, acting as an independent political force. And then, when we invited the intellectuals to join us, they came to the square and addressed us as children. The message we got from them was this. You people have gone too far. You have to do this gradually. Listen to your mommy and daddy. Listen to your government. Well, all I have to say is, what have you done that gives you the right to criticize us? The 12 scholars had made an accurate assessment of the situation, and they were well-intentioned. They knew this stalemate would harm the students' cause. But all the students had put so much into the hunger strike, how could the government simply ignore us? If we left, it would have been like encouraging a bully. Emotionally, we couldn't accept that. You can tell me all you want about what a rational person should do, but I say, excuse me, I can't be that rational because I'm not facing a rational opponent. We failed completely. At the time, I felt we intellectuals were caught between a totally irrational government and totally irrational students. What could we do? Although most students were unimpressed by the intellectuals' attempt at mediation, some shared their belief that Gorbachev's visit would help the cause of reform in China. As a last-minute compromise, Wu Kai-shi led the call to make room for the official welcoming ceremony for the Soviet leader. We really weren't willing. We decided not to move because, well, I'll quote the words of a foreign reporter. He said, you are already on a hunger strike. What more can they ask of you? On the night of the 14th, everybody was waiting for the clearing of the square. Everyone was restless. Why aren't they coming? Why aren't they coming? On the morning of the 15th, I phoned a friend. We both felt that the situation was very grim. If the government ignored the students on May 15th, they would be put in a very awkward position. What were they going to do? Stay on a hunger strike forever? If the government can simply stand by and watch while the students' lives slowly waste away like this, we will have to take even more drastic measures. We will set ourselves on fire. If the government is callous enough to see these children starve to death, then I will be the first to die. I said this over the loudspeakers. I said I was willing to be the commander-in-chief. I don't remember my exact words. I said the only criterion for a person to join the hunger strike leadership was a willingness to be the first to die, so that other students could live on. The government chose to cancel the grand ceremony planned for Tiananmen Square. Gorbachev got only a quick welcome at the airport. 
The first visit to China by a Soviet head of state since 1959 had been upstaged by the students. Gorbachev met with party leaders like Zhao Ziyang, who looked to the Soviet Union as an example of political reform, and with others like Premier Li Peng, who were wary of everything Gorbachev represented. Both groups in the Chinese government needed the backing of Deng Xiaoping, who was in charge of the military, and thus held the real reins of power. By now, the hunger strikers had been in the square for two days, and their numbers were increasing constantly. Still, there was no official response. As time dragged on, sympathy for the students and anger at the government grew. I couldn't even convince my own students to leave. The female students cried whenever I spoke to them. In the morning sun, the students looked so young, with only sheets of newspapers between themselves and the bare ground. It was really a touching sight. They were putting their young lives on the line, sitting there stubborn. But the government was ignoring them. I was moved. So I decided to stay on the square to help them run errands. We workers and ordinary people had been looking on. Then, when the students started the hunger strike, using their own lives to awaken the whole nation, people felt their responsibilities, and they rose up too. On May 16th, while Gorbachev continued his discussions with the Chinese leadership, 300,000 people marched in the streets of Beijing. On the 17th, and again on the 18th, that number rose to one million people. I went to the square every day after May 15 because a lot of students from my university were taking part in the hunger strike. I went there to help them with logistics and run errands. I also took part in the picket line to ensure that the ambulances could move freely. The students had been on a hunger strike for nearly a week. And still, the government paid no attention to them. We said, what bastards? Any son of a bitch would have acted better than Deng Xiaoping or Li Peng. Moderate government leaders tried to defuse the mounting crisis. The official media was allowed to report sympathetically on the hunger strike. Emergency medical teams were sent in to ensure the health of the hunger strikers. Actions like these suggested that the party line was shifting and nobody wanted to be left on the wrong side. Local party leaders and managers started permitting their workers to go to Tiananmen to show support for the students. Organized contingents started showing up carrying the banners of their workplaces. To participate now was beginning to look not only right, but safe. The spectacle was overwhelming and highly photogenic. The foreign press in Beijing to cover the Sino-Soviet summit walked into the biggest international media story ever reported out of China. What a place, what a time, what a story. It's Friday morning here, and this is Tiananmen Square. Today, it's 
the People's Square, all right. More than a million Chinese demanding democracy and freedom and proclaiming the new revolution. Unbelievable. We all came here to cover a summit and we walked into a revolution. It's a great feeling to get the attention of tens of thousands of people. Before the movement, the students had been very depressed. All of a sudden, they were at center stage. People needed them. They felt a heroic sense of being able to change history. This feeling was a boost to their egos and whet their appetites for more. There's never been a generation like ours, one that mocked the state, mocked the government, mocked the leaders. And there's never been a generation that has seen that the outside world is so beautiful. Sui Jian is China's most famous singer. His song, Nothing to My Name, expresses our feelings. Does our generation have anything? We don't have the goals our parents had. We don't have the fanatical idealism our older brothers and sisters once had. So what do we want? Nike shoes. Lots of free time to take our girlfriends to a bar. The freedom to discuss an issue with someone. And to get a little respect from society. In this process, there was something so pure, so unforgettable. There were also things I couldn't accept, even things I found repulsive. But they were all mixed together, and this is history. History is this kind of process. There's no way to sort things out neatly. For example, during the hunger strike, some students were actually eating. They felt that the hunger strike was only a means to an end. Our aim is to put pressure on the government, so why should we make real sacrifices? One student was outraged. You people are manipulating the public. He said, once you turn your sacrifice into a hoax, you lose your moral integrity. So he wrote in blood, I want to use my blood to defend the purity of the hunger strike. I was very moved. This kind of gesture might not have any significant political impact, but to me it showed a deep sense of decency, something that had become very rare in China. During the days of mounting protest, reformist officials faced an impossible predicament. They didn't have the power to make the concessions the students demanded, yet they knew if they couldn't get the students to leave the square, hardliners were more than willing to use force. And the army had already been mobilized. Furthermore, since the breakdown of the May 14 talks, it was no longer clear who really represented the students. The only way to communicate with the protesters was to appeal directly to the crowds in the square. On May 16th, accompanied by student leader Wang Dan, the reformist official Yan Ming Fu made such an attempt. He was on the verge of tears. He asked the students to give the party reformers more time. He even went out on a limb to tell us that the problem of the April 26th editorial would definitely be solved, but it would take time. He was very sincere. He said that the Central Committee had guaranteed the student activists wouldn't be persecuted. He said, if you don't believe me, you can take me hostage. Then I said, I hope everyone will consider this proposal carefully. But the atmosphere was so highly emotional, it was impossible for either of us to continue. So Yen Ming Fu left. Only hours after Yen Ming Fu's appearance in the square, a letter from Zhao Ziyang, written on behalf of the Central Committee, was broadcast. In essence, it contradicted the April 26th editorial. But the strike continued. The following day, Premier Li Peng summoned a group of student leaders to the Great Hall of the People for a televised meeting. 
Some hunger strikers came straight from their hospital beds. In the pre-dawn hours of May 19th, a worn and haggard Zhao Ziyang appeared suddenly on Tiananmen Square. Zhao had lost out to the hardliners in the party. On the verge of tears, he said to the students, we have come too late. We deserve your criticism. Zhao then disappeared from public view. When the reformers were still in power, that is to say before Zhao Ziyang was removed, he was the most powerful person next to Deng Xiaoping. The students didn't accept any of Zhao Ziyang's compromises. They didn't want to cooperate with him in any way. Once he was defeated, it was the hardliners' turn to show how they deal with things. The government was now ready to declare martial law. This news was leaked to the hunger strike headquarters ahead of time. The students suddenly announced the end of their week-long hunger strike and began a mass sit-in. On the evening of May 19th, Premier Li Pang addressed an emergency meeting of state and army leaders. His speech was broadcast as army units moved toward the city. Li Peng's speech only served to incite the people of Beijing. Street merchants got on their motorcycles. Calling themselves the Flying Tigers, they sped to the square to report on troop movements. Convoys were blocked by crowds of protesters and their supporters. <laughs> The People's Liberation Army had entered Beijing once before, in 1949. It was a time when the PLA was welcomed in many cities. Over the years, the army was seen as a true people's army, from the people, of the people, and for the people. The party said that the army was like fish and the people like water. Fish can't live out of water. The PLA was the guardian of the state, protector of the people. In times of natural disaster, the army was there to help fight floods, famine, and fire.
Party propaganda promoted a popular image of the army. Films, fiction, and stage productions celebrated the PLA and created a pantheon of army heroes for mass consumption. In early 1989, the PLA received its annual tribute in the Chinese New Year TV extravaganza. Now, 40 years after being welcomed into Beijing, the army was coming again. This time, it came as an alien force. On the morning of May 20th, martial law regulations were announced. The police and the army were authorized to clear the streets. But people ignored the government's orders. The city was still jammed with demonstrators. Helicopters were the only military vehicles moving. <laughs> Faced with the threat of armed repression, the students tried to mobilize even greater public support. Just at the moment when the students most needed the support and protection of a mass movement, a group of workers declared the founding of an independent union. They set up a public address station at the northwest corner of Tiananmen Square. I became a broadcaster. People sent us a lot of letters. For the last 40 years, there had been no channel for them to express themselves. By broadcasting their letters, we gave them a voice. There are many people like me. We wanted to listen to something simple, direct, and to the point. The Independent Workers' Union not only put forth our own demands, it also helped out the students by sending them food and water. Without the people of Beijing, the workers, the farmers from the outskirts of the city, and the street merchants, the students could not have persisted for long. The new union helped mobilize citizens to block the martial law troops. For some 48 hours, the troops remained stuck in the sea of the people, moving neither forward nor back. I saw an old woman lying down in front of a military truck. Her face was all wrinkles and she had no front teeth. 
I saw all these ordinary people, acting not out of political calculation or with any ulterior motive, but purely out of sympathy and a sense of justice, confronting the troops to protect the students on Tiananmen Square. I was very moved. Sometimes I was disappointed in how foolish and childish the students could be. Once a couple of them came to me to discuss their plans. One claimed to be the commander-in-chief of student security guards. Tourist map in hand, he began to command. He said, see here, to the south of us there are such and such troops, and to the north of us there are such and such troops. He had all four points of the compass covered. I was reminded of a movie I saw called From Victory to Victory. In it, the communist commander points to a map and says, facing us are this many troops, on our flank are that many troops, and so on. I watched this kid carrying on like this and felt like laughing. He said, if we blockaded every intersection, we'd be spreading our troops too thin. I plan to concentrate our forces closer to the square. I felt that this manner of military command, like a child playing at war, came straight out of communist propaganda. And I wondered, how did I get involved with this lot? The massive show of resistance to the army was successful. The troops pulled back to the suburbs. The danger had passed. People continued to pour into the streets. The workers had helped win a victory for the movement at the square. But unlike the students, their need to make a living tied them to their workplaces. A union unrelated to the workplace is not really a union at all. Yet here we were, setting up a union at Tiananmen Square, inspired by a student movement. What kind of future could it possibly have? But there was no way we could organize in the factories. Furthermore, I knew that the movement was going to come to an end soon. All we could do was to try to take advantage of the popular fervor to educate the workers, to let them know that the Constitution grants them all kinds of rights, none of which have been put into practice. This way, after the movement in the streets ended and things returned to normal, some effects of the movement would still be felt. What I mean here is an awareness of constitutional rights. Workers and peasants would know what rights they should enjoy. They'd also know about the legal channels open to them so they can demand those rights. Meanwhile, among the students, a struggle over tactics unfolded. Some of us wanted the students to leave the square. Not only out of consideration for the student's safety, we also thought it was good tactics. By leaving the square, we would have undermined the rationale for imposing martial law, and that might have given the reformers in the government an opportunity. Many students do not understand that the square is our only stronghold. Some people have repeatedly advocated that we leave, but that could only please the government. What makes me really sad is that I am the commander-in-chief, and I can't let go of this power because I must resist compromise, resist these traitors. The leaders of the independent student unions of Beijing and of the provinces are all after my power. In the intense atmosphere of the square, the leaders with more radical agendas had the advantage. These were people who had come to prominence through the hunger strike. They had not stood for elections on campus. 
Their credentials were a determination to make the greatest sacrifices. Their power base, the continuing acclaim of their followers. They set up a new headquarters to defend Tiananmen Square. Once more, Chai Ling became commander in chief. The commander had control of the loudspeakers, the voice of the square that broadcast to the masses. The continued hardline pursued by the government would further undermine moderation and encourage a hardline among the students. I used to believe that we could establish democratic processes and then a lot of people could use science to really help our country. But now I've come to realize that unless we overthrow this inhuman government, our country will have no hope. Our people will have no hope.